Come on. Come on. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. You know, computer technology has advanced considerably in the last several decades, going leaps and bounds in a single lifetime. Hell, I can still remember being a little kid in the early 90s and playing gods and magic pockets on an old Amiga computer. Admittedly, magic pockets has not aged well at all, but gods on the Genesis is still good. Hell, I actually prefer the music on the Genesis version to the original Amigas, and... And I'm getting really off track here. The point is that nobody could have anticipated where we are at this moment in time. Computers with amazingly fast processing speeds, graphic interfaces in every conceivable color, and storage capacities that have jumped in every generation. How did Avery Brooks put it in those IBM commercials? Long ago, information was measured only in kilobytes. Then came megabytes and gigabytes, then terabytes, petabytes, and exabytes. Today, with all this information flying back and forth on the web, we will soon arrive at eurobytes. How big is that? 10 to the 24th power, 1,000 billion trillion bytes. Hell, even watching a video online like you're doing right now was considered laughably impossible back in the day. Another story from my childhood about how old I feel. When I was a little kid, I scoured the internet for sound clips from stuff like Doctor Who, Star Trek, and Mystery Science Theater 3000. Video files were a distant dream. You couldn't compress video well enough, and even the clips that looked decent couldn't last for more than 30 seconds without taking up half a hard drive, which in those days was a few hundred megabytes for me and only the one drive. The point I'm trying to make with all of this, other than boring you all with tales of how I spent my free time when I was six, is that it's easy to look back at the Tandy Computer WizKids comics and laugh. And hell, I've done it myself. Stuff like the TRS-80 from Tandy was probably top of the line when it came out, but the way they hype it up is just so laughable compared to modern technology. Hell, my friggin' DS probably has more power behind it than that thing. I admit a certain level of nostalgia for these older times, like when I played Galactic Conquest on a Commodore 64, which didn't even have graphics of spaceships, just numbers, and it was the most exciting thing to behold. But then again, that's why I have a Commodore 64 emulator. Anyway, what I'm getting at here is it's that time again. Time to make fun of the TRS-80 WizKids in The Computers That Saved Metropolis. Off. Instant loading program packs turn our color TV into a game arcade. The color computer is also an education center. Like our last outing with the Whiz Kids, today's Kindling actually is a Superman comic. What with the Superman logo slapped across the top and the Whiz Kids getting shoved down at the bottom, despite the fact that it says right there that it's starring them. What's that? You want me to recap the other two WizKids reviews? <laughs> well, of course! I made this handy-dandy film that explains it succinctly. <laughs> Anyway, our cover features the villain Major Disaster, and yes, that is a real supervillain in comics, and later reformed as a hero, and then died in Infinite Crisis. Working to kill Superman, who's carrying around some people in a green car that are falling out of it. Sorry, citizens, I just have a compulsion to destroy green cars whenever I see them. It's been like this since I started. It's not all that bad a cover, though as an attention-getter, I'm not sure how many readers Major Disaster brings in. This is Superman's last heroic act. After he blows away the tornado, he won't be able to think straight. Damn tornadoes, where's the quick bunny when you need him? 
We open on a prologue, of course we do, because a 30-page comic advertising Radio Shack products really needs a prologue. Furthermore, it's not really a prologue because the events it shows happen later in the comic. It depicts Superman going for a jumbo jet and the TRS-80 Whiz Kids playing on their computers. A cry for help, a rush of wind, and the world's greatest superhero hurtles into action once more. Considering the definition of hurtles is to move at a great speed, typically in a wildly uncontrolled manner, I'm beginning to think that the world's greatest superhero is actually drunk. While miles below in Metropolis, two young heroes sit at their TRS-80 computers, their fingers flying urgently across the keyboards. I will beat my high score at number munchers, dang it! What is the astonishing connection between these two events? The kids are the ones causing the plane to crash. Astonishing, isn't it? We truly open on Major Disaster monologuing to himself. 8.50 a.m. Only 13 minutes to go before my crowning catastrophe strikes Metropolis. My 9 a.m. morning zoo crew radio show will leave devastation in its wake. Meanwhile, Superman is doing a morning patrol around the city and realizes that he needs to hurry to make his own 9 a.m. appointment. Oddly enough, the opening narration actually sounds more in line with the Twilight Zone than last week's Twilight Zone comic. For your observation, two dynamic men of action. One, a paragon of peril, the insidious master of villainy known to the world as Major Disaster. The other, a caped champion, the mighty man of steel who fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. Together, they'll find themselves in a crossover event comic that takes place in the Twilight Zone. We cut to the Whiz Kids' classroom, where we see that the teacher, Miss Wilson, once again looks completely different from the last two times we saw her. I'm beginning to think that the woman hails from Gallifrey. I trust many of you won't be disappointed when I announce your oral book reports will be postponed until tomorrow. I'm not. I could use another day to practice it. Well, I've been ready to deliver my report for a week. Damn it, at this rate, I'm never going to give my book report on Mein Kampf. Miss Wilson says that next year they'll be taking the school's introductory computer course. Yawn! Just what we've all been waiting for, Miss Wilson. A boring talk on computers. I can't think of anything I'd rather hear about. Except maybe the history of Brussels sprouts. Oh yeah, I should probably point out that this takes place before the Computer Masters of Metropolis, so Alec hasn't yet had his brain assimilated by the TRS-80. By the way, I just noticed this about the WizKids comics. This school must have the worst discipline record ever. The kids are constantly interrupting the teacher. Nobody raises their hands or lets the teacher finish talking before giving their own commentary. Anyway, she explains that their special guest has not only international reputation, but an interplanetary one as well. Let's see now. My friend said he'd be here at 9 o'clock sharp, so we can count on it. According to my digital watch, the time is precisely 8.59.55. Did she just seriously try to shill a friggin' digital watch right there? As if that's something to be impressed by? Then again, digital watches are one of the great questions, aren't they? Why are people born? Why do they die? And why do they spend so much of the intervening time wearing digital watches? Anyway, Superman arrives in the class with two black cases. Naturally, the kids are stunned. Will the rest of the school be jealous? And like the last comic, I have to wonder why the hell Superman only cares about this one class at this one school. If friggin' Superman is here, they should gather all the students in the auditorium. This is just bizarre. Shanna asks Superman what's in the cases. It would be hard to believe, Shanna, without giving you some background information first. You ever read that short story about the box that'll kill someone you don't know if you press the button inside it? You... you called me Shanna, but how did you know my name? Simple. I bet Superman used his x-ray vision to read Miss Wilson's seating chart. Ha 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 Nothing that simple, kids. I'm just watching you all the time. Superman says he'll start with the history of the modern computer, but Alec will have none of this. 
Someone wake me up when he's finished. History and computers are boring enough by themselves, but together, good night. <laughs> Enjoy detention, you loudmouth little craphead. Seriously, it's friggin' Superman, dude. You may not pay attention to what the hell he's saying, but if Superman showed up at my classroom, I'd at least stay awake. I mean, for crying out loud, this was published in 1980. It's not like you're at the point where video games and television have desensitized you yet to ignore the most powerful friggin' superhero on the planet. Superman says he's sorry to hear that he's nodding off. I guess that means you'll be too tired to step outside with the rest of us. Uh-oh. He's gonna go Superman 2 on their asses! Meanwhile, a few miles away, a tornado rips through the streets, causing people to run in terror. Back at the school, everyone has gathered on the roof. Superman starts with a lecture about the beginnings of modern computers, but as commenters have shown in the past, I suck at trying to analyze this stuff, so I'm going to ignore it and his statements about the world's first all-electronic computers being built in 1945 and being built in America. As has been pointed out in previous videos and comments, that is wrong, though they probably didn't know about Colossus in 1980, or the Z1 in Germany, or any of the other computers in Europe and across the world that were electronic, or only partially electronic, or the like, that I just don't care about anymore. The point is that computers used to be really, really big, and that is all Superman is trying to point out with his dumbass history lesson. The inside of this huge 30-ton superbrain contained 18,000 vacuum tubes, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, and 6,000 switches. It took at least four computers of this type to create three frames for an animated GIF in those days. Superman says he brought them up to the roof to demonstrate that computers back then filled up rooms as big as the entire roof which actually looks like a pretty small roof to me. Also, why are there only 10 kids in this class? Golly, I don't even see how you could get something that big into a room. They probably built the computer first, then built a room around it, Dodo. Oh, for crying out loud, you're sixth graders, and yet you're dumb enough to not realize that they probably assembled the computers from smaller parts. And please be reminded, a computer is more than a calculator. Computers can also organize and remember words, analyze information, and make comparisons. All this in seconds. A computer can also aid in identity theft, watch a YouTube video remix of It's Over 9000, and download pornography. All this in seconds. In fact, its capabilities are almost unlimited. Can a computer stop my parents from getting divorced? Uh, gotta go, kids! Today's microcomputers, the old-time big computers squeezed down to the size of a small TV set attached to a typewriter-like keyboard, can teach math, English, other languages, and history. It can play games, perform household tasks. What the hell kind of household tasks can a computer from 1980 perform? All right, Commodore Vic-20, vacuum my living room! I'm waiting! And no, you are not allowed to ruin my joke by pointing out that it can do calculations and taxes and crap. If they meant that, they should have said that. Then, of course, there's the space program. Without the vital role played by computers, our astronauts would never have made it to the moon and back. Except for Apollo 18, damn moon spiders. Anyway, blah blah blah, transistors, circuits, and other history lessons. As the Action Ace ushers the students back into the classroom... Wait, Action Ace? That wasn't seriously one of Superman's nicknames, was it? Or are they referring to this black kid right here who we saw earlier had a rockin' fro? Anyway, back in the classroom, it seems the black cases actually contained TRS-80s with user manuals and 12-inch video displays. It used to be that a computer able to do these things would have cost a fortune, but today you can buy a microcomputer for the price of a good camera or TV set. Though you will get infinitely less enjoyment out of it than those items. Solid state circuitry, electronic chips, and modern assembly line production methods are bringing the cost of microcomputers within reach of millions of people for schools as learning aids and small businesses. Look, Superman, we already bought the damn things. You don't have to keep trying to sell them to us. 
After Superman gives some more information about computers, including the awesome computer language known as BASIC, he gets the class working and then disappears, hearing something in the distance but not wanting to warn the kids, or be polite enough to even say, sorry kids, have to go deal with a disaster or the like. After rescuing some people from some rubble, he sees the tornado ripping through the streets. Question 1. What's a tornado doing tearing through Metropolis in the off-season, when weather conditions indicate fair skies? And question 2. What do I do to solve the answer to question 1? Readers, you will be tested on this later. We've stopped spinning around and are shooting out of the tornado funnel. We must have been flung off by centrifugal force. Let's exposit about the way we're about to die horribly. Superman saves them and takes on the tornado by using his super breath to knock the tornado away. And into a building from the looks of the debris. Thanks, Superman! You defeated the tornado by no doubt killing the innocent people in that building or just by causing more property damage. Our hero, everyone! Meanwhile, back at the scene that does not include superheroes fighting tornadoes... Oh, wow, Miss Wilson! Writing programs on the TRS-80 is as easy as using a typewriter! That's right, Shanna. Always remember to hit the Enter button. It tells the computer to take a look at what you've typed and act accordingly. Huh. Ten print, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Twenty go to ten. Superman returns, since of course it's not like he'd want to stick around and do damage control with the people injured or who have lost their homes in the tornado or anything. Superman, what you said about the giant computers of years ago that used to weigh 30 tons, can something as small as a TRS-80 do everything those giant computers did? Everything and more, William! Yeah, I just found the games folder! Shall we play a game? Global Thermonuclear War. Get this, they decide to hold a test to see who's faster, the TRS-80 or Superman. They have the two convert 65 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius, and wouldn't you know it, they do so at the same speed. Gee, the TRS-80 really does think as fast as Superman! Wow, that's incredible! A tornado just spontaneously appeared in Metropolis, and you're playing on a friggin' computer! Anyway, Alec decides to try the test with Superman with a different problem, but Soup suddenly develops a headache and his mental processes are slowed, allowing the computer to figure out the answer faster. Alec, being a complete dickhead, laughs at how Superman isn't as super after all, and obviously because he inputted the program, he has the superior brain. <laughs> yeah, laugh it up, kid. Keep that attitude and you'll find that TRS-80 crammed right up your ass. Miss Wilson excuses Superman from anything else with the class, having noticed the look on his face. Meanwhile, Major Disaster watches Superman on his oddly shaped screen. Why, of course he has a massive screen that can observe superheroes, despite having no camera equipment in any logical location to get the angles he's viewing from. Those kinds of things just come standard with villain layers. He monologues to himself about how the true purpose of the tornado was to release millions of microscopic kryptonite crystals into the air, which he breathed in when preparing his super breath. Crystals I synthesized not to weaken his superpowers? No, that would be far too simple and obvious. I mean, who cares about actually weakening and killing Superman? That's too obvious. Wow, man, you set a new standard for dumb villain plans. You know the correct thing to do, but you don't want to do it because it's too obvious. Kryptonite is poison. You could have killed him or, as you said, robbed him of his powers. Your new name is Major Dumbass. So Major Dumbass says that instead, they're designed to attack the nerve cells of his brain, basically screwing up his ability to send signals throughout his body, and therefore make it difficult for him to fly and think straight. Superman manages to crash through the floor of his apartment and stops himself. It's lucky the tenant is always out this time of day. I should be able to manage my superpowers enough to repair the damage before he comes home. That night, the tenant returned home to discover carpeting on his ceiling. Major Dumbass makes an announcement that he wants... something, I don't know, and that to prove that he can do what he says, he'll use his powers to cause three potential disasters. 
Not real disasters, mind you, but potential ones. There's a threat for you. What are you gonna do, leave a lit cigarette unattended on a couch? It's not an actual disaster, just a potential one. Back in the classroom, after they overhear this announcement from Major Dumbass, we learn this. And also in this morning's news is the simultaneous breakdown of computers which have crippled every major computer system throughout the area. Fortunately, most people were not affected by this breakdown, though there was one unhappy individual. Let me on the information superhighway! Honey. I want on the information superhighway! We'll be right back. Careful with that. There's no return Calm down. Calm down. Let's discuss the effect this computer breakdown could have on our everyday lives and review the many ways computers have been faithfully serving us. How about a book, Miss Wilson? You ever actually read books in your classroom? Are computers the only thing that occupy your lesson plan? Superman crashes up from the floor, saying he had to come in from the underground because it was too dangerous to fly around the city. Oh, sure, that makes sense, except for all the electrical and pipe damage you no doubt caused by flying in through the floor. Superman explains that the computer breakdown is also the result of Major Dumbass. Major Disaster was smart enough to know I could have rigged up a microwave relay with one of those computer systems. Oh, I see! The computers could do the instant computations and calculations your brain would normally do, so you could still use your superpowers! Of course! Don't you know anything about science? Okay, this is stupid. Yes, a brain is similar to a computer, but really only in a metaphorical sense. The problem is not that his brain can't make friggin' computations and calculations, it's that the nerves connecting his brain to the rest of his body have been numbed to the point where he can't control himself and he can't think clearly. Being able to do math is not the problem here! Anyway, his brilliant plan is to use the TRS-80s in the class, which weren't affected by the breakdown, to do his computations for him, and the kids will operate the computers and relay the information to him. Sure, why not? Because having two sixth graders who only just learned how to use the damn things yesterday is really the plan you want to implement here. He uses his telescopic vision to find the first disaster, a lightning bolt that strikes a jetliner and sends it into a nosedive. Shove that control into a nosedive, Hulk Hogan! Superman flies towards it and then gives calculations about the incline it's going, the gravitational pull, the wind variance. Oh, for the love of crap, Superman is not a robot! Fly fast, get out of the plane, and level it off so it doesn't crash into the ground! You do not need complex mathematics to figure out something as simple as DON'T LET THE PLANE CRASH! But no, instead they need to calculate how fast he needs to fly to compensate for the wind and still reach the jetliner before it crashes into the ground. Just flying towards it and going faster is not enough. No, no, no. He needs real numbers here, people. Oh, and naturally we don't even see that number. They just apparently give it to Superman off-panel, and he's able to save the jetliner. Fantabulous. Next up, Major Dumbass has ruptured a water reservoir and the city is flooding. He needs to know how many millions of gallons of water have overflowed so he can then determine the amount of heat vision he needs to rain down to evaporate the water. He says if he beams down too much heat vision, there'd be a mass meltdown. A mass meltdown of what? This isn't a nuclear reactor here, it's a water reservoir. It's okay if a car or the road gets damaged a little if it means no more flooding. Ignoring the idea that evaporating that much water will probably create new problems, how difficult is it to just use enough heat vision to evaporate the water and then stop when the water is gone? So yeah, they pull it off again, also making me wonder how they knew how much water was in the reservoir to begin with, and Superman is able to evaporate the water without harming the neighborhood. Except, of course, for the damage the water already caused. And, of course, the worst is last. Major Dumbass punctured a leak in a nuclear reactor, causing radioactive gases into the air. I'm sure that punching a hole in a nuclear reactor would do a hell of a lot more damage than just radioactive gases, but whatever. This one actually kind of requires the computers. They need to know how fast he needs to fly at precisely the correct spinning circumferences to siphon the gases up into space. 
forgetting that the leak is still there, so it's just going to keep sending out gas, so he's going to need to keep doing this for a while, and even faster and faster since he needs to maintain this little cylinder for a few hundred kilometers past the atmosphere and far into space so there's no fallout. Let's also shut off our brains on the fact that Superman isn't immune to radiation himself. Hell, kryptonite is dangerous to him because it's radioactive. They don't say if he plugs the leak or not, or how many people died from the nuclear accident, but instead we cut to an epilogue where Major Dumbass, and really trying to cause a nuclear incident in the city you were in, my nickname for him is so damn accurate, is taken by Superman to the police. He talks to the reporters there and explains how he tracked Major Dumbass using the energy he used in his disasters, and then says that the effects of the kryptonite crystals have worn off. Miss Lang, I couldn't have done it without the help of the very latest in computer technology, and two very special young friends. But why don't we let them do the rest of the talking? And so our comic ends with the scene shifting over to Shanna and Alec showing off the TRS-80 computer. We are going to demonstrate how any of you people watching at home can think as super fast as a Superman with a TRS-80 microcomputer. But only if you declare us the Computer Masters of Metropolis! <laughs> this comic sucks! The villain, despite having a lot of power and resources at his command, wastes them and almost kills himself in the process. Superman needing to use that stupid computer to accomplish tasks that don't require any actual calculations is just moronic, and he cares more about educating 6th graders on a computer instead of trying to help people harmed by a tornado! And yes, there are more of these WizKids comics, though I think there's only one more that features superheroes. But I don't own that one or any of the other WizKids comics. If you have some that you'd like to donate, send me an email, but don't expect me to look at these things again for a while. Let the Radio Shack TRS-80 put the world of color computing into your home. Instant loading program packs turn any color TV into an exciting game arcade. And there's more. The color computer is an educational aid, a home management tool, and up-to-the-minute electronic information service. The programmable, expandable TRS-80 color computer from $399 only at Radio Shack, the biggest name in little computers. You've heard or read about low-cost personal computers. Today, you can see and buy the price leader. Radio Shack's famous under $600 system. Learn how computing can benefit your business, profession, record keeping, and your education. Come into your nearby Radio Shack today. You will be convinced. The TRS-80 personal computer system, only $599, built and serviced by Radio Shack, a Tandy company. So here's my question, did the TRS-80 WizKids get rebooted in the recent DC relaunch too?